So it's my pleasure to introduce Johannes Rebelein, who has completed his PhD in, at the University of California, uh, Irvine, working with uh, Marcus Ribe on nitrogenases. And in 2017, Johannes joined uh, Tom Award uh, Lab at the University of Basel in uh, uh, Switzerland as a long-term fellow uh, where he works on engineering of artificial uh, metalloenzymes. So this will be a topic that he will tell us about today. Uh, since uh, since he completed, I just want to mention that since he completed his postdoctoral work, uh, Johannes now started his own uh, lab at Max uh, Planck uh, Institute uh, for, for Terrestrial Microbiology in Marburg, Germany, where he continues his interest in met uh, metalloenzymes and, and biocatalysis. So without further ado, Johannes, please take, a, uh, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, as Anja said, my name is Johannes Rebelein and I'm going to talk about artificial metalloenzymes. The first question is, of course, what are artificial metalloenzymes? And to us, artificial metalloenzymes are proteins or enzymes shown here, which contain a synthetic or artificial metal catalyst, like this iridium-based catalyst um, shown here. The question is now, how can we target such a synthetic metal catalyst to a protein or an enzyme? And I'm going to explain this on the example of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase has in the active site a sink, which, which in nature catalyzes the conversion of CO2 to bicarbonate and protons. Um, but for this enzyme, several uh, inhibitors have been described and a lot of them are based on this aryl sulfonamide, which very tightly binds to the zinc in the active site. So if you now use this inhibitor and link it to your metal catalyst, you have just created an artificial metal cofactor because after addition of this metal cofactor to your protein, it will bind and through this, it will construct a, an artificial metalloenzyme. Using this and similar approaches, the Ward Lab has constructed various artificial metalloenzymes, such as the artificial benzanolase based on rhodium as shown here, artificial metasases based on rosinium, which uh, catalyze a ring closing metastasis, releasing a product here, fluorescent umbelliferone, or artificial transfer hydrogenases based on iridium as shown on the second slide. Basically, our artificial uh, metallo cofactor um, overrides the function of the protein and introduces its reactivity. Nonetheless, artificial metalloenzymes are a great opportunity to, bind, to combine um, artificial or synthetic catalysts with an enzymatic environment so that we can actually use uh, um, features of both. And what I mean with features is, for example, the stereoselectivity. So homogeneous catalysts usually produce a racemic mixture where enzymes produce a single end enzymer. Um, also homogeneous catalysts usually work only in organic solvents and they're quickly inactivated in aqueous solution. The substrate specificity is also a big difference between a homogeneous catalyst and enzymes. Normally, homogeneous catalysts uh, accept a wide range of substrates, whereas enzymes are very specific and uh, most of the time only accept one substrate. And of course, these artificial metalloenzymes allow us to basically build a bridge between chemistry and biology. For example, if we introduce a homogeneous catalyst into a protein, you can think that this protein might protect the catalyst and through this, it increases in its compatibility compatibility with a cellular environment. And this is actually a, um, a big current theme where, which we are working on. We are trying to use these artif artificial metalloenzymes and, and to run them in a uh, cellular environment. And in order to achieve this, we need to optimize our artificial metalloenzymes and we do it two ways. On the one hand, we can chemically optimize our metal cofactor, but we can also optimize uh, through genetic engineering our protein, for example, by directed evolutions. And on these two points, I want to focus on the rest of this talk. First, I'm going to talk about the chemical optimization of the metallo cofactor, 
And in the second part, I'm talking about the protein engineering and the directed evolution of our protein scaffold carbonic anhydrase. As I've mentioned, we are very much interested in, in using artificial metalloenzymes in a cellular environment. And in order um, to, to improve the metal, these artificial metalloenzymes, we first of all need a screening. And here I've established a whole cell screening, which compartmentalizes our artificial metalloenzyme in the periplasm of E. coli, so between outer and inner membrane of E. coli. In order to achieve this, I uh, linked my chain of interest carbonic anhydrase to a signal peptide, OMP-A. After introduction, uh, after induction and expression, the protein is then transferred to the periplasm. At this point, we can add our um, metal cofactor to the cells, which is able to cross the outer membrane, but not able to cross the inner membrane. And uh, in the periplasm, it then binds to the zinc atom invective site to form our artificial metalloenzyme. And now we can add our substrate, which is in this case re, um, uh, reduced through uh, artificial transfer hydrogenation and the releasing uh, fluorescent embolipherone. And we picked a fluorescent product it, because it's easy to monitor and to follow the reaction. Besides compartmentalizing artificial metalloenzymes in the periplasm, I've also established a second system where our artificial metalloenzyme is displayed on the cell surface of E. coli, which very much works the same way, except that we now use LPP and a different part of OMPA and linked it to carbonic anhydrase so that our protein is shown on the cell surface. And of course, now we can also construct our artificial metalloenzyme to release umbelliferone. After demonstrating that we really can compartmentalize carbonic anhydrase either in the periplasm or on the surface, we of course went ahead and performed catalysis. And we started out with a previously published cofactor shown here. And this uh, cofactor works quite well in vitro with purified proteins. But as you can see here, unfortunately not for the whole cell system, so neither in the periplasm nor on the cell surface, I could observe really activity. And in order to improve these cofactors, I've teamed up with Johan Kotel, who, who was at that point in a, a postdoc in Tom's lab. And he, dis, he suggested that we first of all um, remove the picoline sulfonamide and replace it by a picoline amide here. He also introduced the hydroxy group here. And when I use cofactor six, I could indeed for the first time observe activity uh, in the periplasm and on the cell surface. At this point, we wanted further optimize um, the, this cofactor. And what we did is we had a closer look um, at the linker length. So we introduced a C2 carbon linker and over here a C3 carbon linker. And um, uh, he removed also the hydroxy group in cofactor eight. Using these cofactors, we indeed could increase the activity and uh, observe uh, particularly for cofactor seven high activities in the periplasm and on the cell surface. At this point, I wanted to uh, know better how this the artificial metalloenzyme looks like and also the binding uh, of cofactor seven. So I've crystallized carbonic anhydrase, soaked it with cofactor seven. And here you see the structure. Um, you see that our cofactor not only binds at the zinc atom down here, but it also forms a hydrogen bond between with uh, glutamine 92. In addition, you see also here as the red mesh, the anomalous electron density of the iridium atom. And you see that this sphere is very well defined, which tells you that the, that the catalyst really takes up only one conformation and it is really tightly bound by the protein. If we compare now cofactor seven with the other cofactors, the main difference is actually the iridium position. So cofactor seven and eight, the one with the two carbon linker, sit 1.3 angstrom deeper inside the binding pocket than the other cofactors. Which tells you that, that for example, the alpha helix and particularly the phenyl alanine 130 is better protecting our cofactor. And it also better defines the binding of the substrate. To summarize uh, this part, um, we could compartmentalize artificial metalloenzymes in the periplasm and on the surface of E. coli. 
We could improve the previously best published iridium CPC star cofactor by 68 fold. And we observed a total turnover number of 90 for whole cell catalysis. And I know that is not very high uh, for natural enzymes, but as I mentioned, the cellular environment usually inactivates very quickly the homogeneous catalyst. So we are actually quite happy about this number. Nonetheless, we wanted to move on and now we turn towards protein engineering and directed evolution to further increase the activity. And uh, here we started again out with cofactor seven, I've shown you on one of the last slides. And Johan was uh, suggested now what, what happens if we actually remove the hydroxy group here and introduce a nitro group for this cofactor. And maybe we could also install a cysteine in close proximity um, to the cofactor. And potentially then the nitro group uh, reacts with a cysteine to form uh, a, a covalent bond so that we could dually anchor our, uh, our cofactor. So I've uh, crystallized the protein, solved the structure, and I've identified two residues in close proximity, isoleucine 91 and glutamate uh, 69. I've introduced cysteines as mutations, purified the protein and also crystallized them. And here you see uh, the FO minus FC difference map of the cofactor bound to our mutant. And you see, first of all, the cofactor is very well defined. It also looks like that we, we have a covalent bond. And indeed, when I build the cofactor in, I see the formation of a covalent bond. And interestingly, it was a sulfonamide formed here. So this is actually a new uh, bioconjugation reactivity, which was not previously observed, that actually a, a cysteine can react with a nitro group to form a sulfonamide, as shown here. We have, not all, uh, we have also investigated the second mutant where we mutated glutamate 69 into a cysteine. And also uh, as shown here, I observed the formation of our sulfonamide bond. So also this cofactor is covalently anchored but overall the density is not quite as good. And I also see uh, several spots of anomalous uh, density, which tells you that not all of the cofactor is covalently bound, only around 70%, and the rest is still flexible. And if you look at the cofactor, you see that this is actually quite strained. You see this on the C shape. So that's probably the reason why we do not see the, the complete um, uh, formation of the covalent anchor. Nonetheless, we have now uh, two amino acids, uh, two artificial metalloenzymes in hand, which form uh, the, the dual anchor. So we, of course, wanted to test them for activity. And now we used uh, harmaline as a substrate. And as a, we used wild type E69C and I91C, you see that all of them uh, have around the same activity. But interestingly, E69C uh, could increase the stereocell activity. And even more interesting was that I91C actually inverts the stereocell activity. So also observing a complete formation of a covalent bond for I91C, we focused um, on I91C and decided to carry out a directed evolution campaign. So first of all, we identified amino acids in close proximity to our cofactor. And here in the first library we generated, we generated a double library where we at the same time mutated uh, asparagine 67 and glutamate 69. In the next step, we mutated asparagine 62. And in the last step, uh, we had a closer look at leucine 60. Since we also here had to screen a lot of uh, mutants, um, although we used a small intelligent focused library, we still needed to screen more than 1,200 mutants for the first library. We again went back to the surface display I've shown you earlier, where we um, create or construct our artificial metalloenzyme on the cell surface of E. coli, and now add uh, harmaline as a substrate. And in the interest of the time, I'm going straight actually to the final results of the screening. And first of all, on the left side, you see our controls. You see the wild type I91C, and then in highlighted in yellow, you see the R selective mutants, and in uh, pinkish, uh, the S selective mutants. And you see that, particularly, the double library really increased 
with stereo cell activity, but also the activity. So now uh, glycine in position 67 was really good and 16, uh, arginine in position 69. And at this point, we were wondering what happens if we actually remove again the cysteine, which we actually did shown over here. And you see that not only the activity drops, but particularly the stereo selectivity dramatically drops, which tells you that this dual anchor is really important for catalysis to improve the stereo selectivity and for the binding of the cofactor. The, the subsequent steps or libraries where we mutated position 62 and 60 only resulted in slight improvements of activity. Nonetheless, we could also um, uh, identify as selective mutants um, when uh, aspartame 62 was um, mutated into a, lyst, a leucine and uh, glutamate 69 into a tyrosine. And particularly also the conversion of leucine 60 to tryptophan really increased the activity. As a last step, we purified all um, the best identified mutants and uh, still performed a substrate screen with them. And although all these mutants were not um, evolved for the sh here shown substrates, we um, indeed observed quite an increase uh, we see, see there's still very good activities. For example, here we see complete um, turnover and we see different um, stereo selectivities. So we think that these um, dually anchored artificial metalloenzymes are really a great starting point for further evolutionary campaigns. To summarize, um, we use the dual anchor to fix the location and the conformation of our cofactor, which has really a beneficial impact on catalysis and stereo selectivity. Um, doing so, we also discovered a new bioconjugation reaction where the nitro group reacts with the cysteine to form a sulfonamide. And we think that this is really a great platform for further directed evolution approaches to adapt these enzymes or evolve these enzymes towards uh, um, new and other substrates. And we also observed high turnovers and good stereo selectivity for the substrate which we evolved on, harmaline. With this, I hope to show, have shown you that indeed artificial metalloenzymes combine um, beneficial features of both homogeneous catalysts as well as enzymes, and that it is really worth to also optimize both to engineer the metal cofactor, but also to evolve and engineer the protein scaffold. And with this, I want to thank um, Tom Ward at the University of Basel. Um, here, my advisor, Tom Ward, shown here, as well as Johan Kotel, with whom I'm always collaborated, as well as EMBO and NCCR Molecular Systems Engineering for funding. But as Anja mentioned at the beginning, I've in the meanwhile moved on to the Max Planck for terrestrial microbiology in Marburg. And I'm still working on metalloenzymes, now focusing mainly on nat natural metalloenzymes such as nitrogenase, where I not only want to better characterize the conversion of nitrogen and also evolve or engineer nitrogenases for this, but rather engineer a side reactivity of nitrogenases to increase its activity for CO2 conversion to hydrocarbons such as methane, ethylene, but also propane and butane, basically biofuels. So if you are looking for a PhD or postdoc position, feel free to contact me. And with this, I'm at the end and happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you so much, Johannes, for a great, great story and, and, and great also to see that you're moving to uh, back to, to complex natural uh, systems. Uh, before people start um, typing in the questions in Q&A uh, window, I want to ask you from your perspective, is there any difference between engineering artificial enzymes and natural enzymes and what those differences are? Um, yeah, so so I, I think really, as I, as I mentioned, uh, I mean, there's also a difference between, I would say, already metalloenzymes and um, enzymes which use their amino acids to catalyze a reaction. Because with metalloenzymes, usually the reactivity is coming from the metal center. So I think that is already really a main difference you need to keep in mind. But also then, if you look at artificial metalloenzymes and natural uh, metalloenzymes, um, as I said, we, we are 
these um, synthetic metallocofactors allow us to introduce metals which were not used by biology, such as iridium, ruthenium, and, and uh, 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 palladium, for example. And, and that is already a difference. So, so with this, um, there is, there is uh, you know, you introduce also the reactivity. And then I think you more engineer basically the, the, the protein environment to really host this cofactor or also bind and host the substrate. And I think with natural enzymes, you usually have already a very evolved uh, machinery, which has usually also a substrate channel and stuff like this. And I think there is way more involved, particularly also with natural enzymes, you can also um, have effects on sites which are very far of the active sites if you evolve them. And I don't think that this is or very rarely the case for artificial metalloenzymes because you have more of this, this entity which is kind of, you know, added already to the protein. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And, and kind of to follow up briefly, so can you please um, comment on what do you think are the next uh, key innovations that need to happen to advance artificial metalloenzyme uh, and, and on the application on a on a practical scale. Yeah. So I mean to me really really if we look at, at artificial metalloenzymes, I think um, I, I'm interested in two main things. And um, one thing which we have also worked on but I haven't talked about is basically that to exploit artificial metalloenzymes for targeted drug delivery. So the, the scaffold protein, which I have used carbonic anhydrase, there's an isoform carbonic anhydrase 9, which is overexpressed on tumor cells. And if you think about that this, um, that, that your inhibitor very or quite specifically binds to this um, carbonic anhydrase, you could basically exploit this for targeted drug delivery. And in order to achieve this, you just need or you need um, uh, cofactors which are still really active in a biological environment. And to me, that is, that is, I think, actually the biggest challenge because if you reach this, you can also use um, uh, artificial metalloenzymes, for example, for the construction of new metabolic pathways which incorporate also artificial reactivities. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, I think in order for industries, for, for, for bulk chemical production. I think, um, it, you know, you are combining in senses the best of both worlds, but you also combine the difficulties of best of both <laughs> worlds. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see a clear example yet for this. Uh, um, and you, maybe I could ask a question if that's okay. Go ahead. Hey, Hannes. Yeah, so that, that was a very cool story. I really, I really like the sort of dual, sort of the, the dual functionality of the, co of the cofactor. Uh, just a question. So you've shown that nicely that the, your catalysis were dependent upon the cysteine. Did you ever go and check how dependent the cofactor binding and catalysis was on your zinc ion? And as a follow-up, have you ever tried to mutate the coordination sphere of the zinc ion following having, having had that cysteine there? Yeah. Um, actually, that's a very interesting question. We haven't done this yet. We haven't removed the three histidines which uh, bind the zinc and haven't looked into that. Um, I, I, as I said, I cannot give you a clear answer to this, but what I would think would could uh, pose a difficulty is that the, the covalent bond formation is not instantaneous. So actually we need kind of the zinc to buy, first bind the cofactor to direct it at the, at the right side. And, and then uh, to form the covalent bond. And in order to form the covalent bond, we actually shift also the pH to a basic pH, um, okay. which uh, works just better. And uh, as I said, said for I-9D1C, we see really a complete formation of this a covalent bond, but not for E69. And you could think, you know, if we would, if that would kind of go equally fast, you would also form maybe their, but then the rest of the cofactor would mm -hmm. just hang out in a different direction, but I haven't observed anything like this. So, so it's an interesting question we would need to try. Yeah, I, I can imagine if you, if you put it through a, a huge amount of evolution, you may start to favor the, the covalent linkage over the metal linkage. Yeah, that so could be. It's a very, very cool story though, well done. Thank you. <laughs>